All right. Thanks everyone who's joined us here. We'll get started. So tonight I'm gonna work on a, um, a small piece that will be released at San Diego Comic-Con in a few weeks. So, this out here. So this little guy here, here's my actual original sketch. You kinda see the sketch here. And I transferred the sketch onto the background, which I already painted in acrylic. And then I already did the gouache work on this one too, which is with all the color. And the next stage is the enamel line work, and that's what I'm gonna do tonight. So you can see him here, and this is actually the little frame he goes in. You kinda see how it fits in there. He's a long format, so he's a little awkward for the video. We're gonna make it work. I am too, so. All right. So feel free if you have any questions, any anything about you know the dogs, because I know that the dogs are pretty much the highlight of most videos. So any questions you guys have as I go along about what I'm using, what I'm doing, feel free to ask. I'm uh, chatty and sketchy at the same time. So I'm gonna get after it here. I'm gonna just make this guy a little easier to see. So I pre-mixed my enamel already to get the color I wanted. It'll probably look black on the video, but it's actually a deep blue. So mix that up here. A couple of... <laughs> Somebody said, how can I buy it now? <laughs> Uh, so someone asked if they could buy this now. I'm sorry, it's not available actually in person at Comic-Con. So you gotta come on down there. But after Comic-Con, if any originals are still available, we'll probably release them since everyone's watching these. and So we'll see what we can do. Just brave the, you know, 100,000 nerd herd. Get down there, throw some elbows. I hear tickets are really easy to get. Somebody says hello from Antelope Valley, 105 degrees. Whoa! Antelope Valley, I feel bad for you. Today, it's about 75. Even in LA, it was 75. All right. What substrate are you using? So the question was, what substrate is this? This is actually a coated masonite. Um, you can see, it's basically see the, the thickness. So it's coated masonite, and it was all white, and it already comes pre-gessoed from a company called Ampersand. And then basically I do all my backgrounds on top of that. Um, so you sketch on a tablet as an iPad, or what program do you prefer? It's a question about what I sketch with. So this guy here is actually sketched with on tracing paper. Let me show you this sketch again, just in case you came away. So this is actually the original sketch on tracing paper. Um, a lot of the small ones I sketch this way, but for the bigger paintings, I sketch them all on um, a, a Cintiq. It's a 19 inch Cintiq and I sketch in Photoshop. Montez is the sketch for sale. <laughs> the sketch will probably accompany the original, but we may hold on to it for our sketch sale in the future. It's fun to do uh, more comedic versions of paintings I've done a little more serious style of. This painting kind of reminds me of my uh, Clash of the Cosmos, but this is the much funnier version.
This really is my favorite part of the paintings, is kind of carving in all the details. You know, the gouache kind of gives me a, a guideline, but this is really when it's fun. Really just pulling it all together. You know, drawing textures and patterns and... Alright, let's get some more questions out there, guys. Stop drinking now. It's Friday night. Well, let's just hear me ramble on. How did you learn the business aspect of your art business? Good question. How did I learn the business aspect of the art world? I think the most important thing I had that helped me along was working in the corporate world before art. It really taught me just, you know... From a personal side, it taught me to be outgoing and how to present and just be, you know, you know, um, outgoing, I guess probably the easiest way to put it. Um, then it was applying a lot of those same techniques that I learned in business to my art, you know, and I think that's a, a tough part a lot of artists have is how do you make that transition, you know, from the art to the business part. It's, it's not easy and you really have to approach it like a business. Though. I think that's the key that most don't do. You have to treat yourself, you know, like a brand and understand all the challenges that just like a regular company has, you know, things you should be attached to, things you should do, you know, what does your art or your brand need? You know, learning those aspects and treating it like that, like a real company. You know, that's how you grow it. You know, um, understanding what you do poorly, what you do well, and kind of learning and growing. And, you know, one of the most common mistakes I see new artists make is just wanting to be in galleries and sell and, and be famous as fast as possible. You know, and who doesn't? But I think the hardest part is, you know, building a, a portfolio and having a unique style. Things that take some time to develop and you have to get in there and do paintings. You've got to paint a ton to develop these type of things. And I think that's how you kind of learn the business part of it is if you, if you approach the art like a business in the way that you talk about it, the way you do it, you know, like a business. I need to do you know, practice every day just like a bit to get better at skills. I think you need to approach it like that. I think. Admitting that it's a business is the first step to being good at it. You know, I learned a lot trial and error. There wasn't a, a good, you know, it wasn't a skeletal artist. I could go, okay, that guy did this, this, and this. That's what I need to do. You know, there wasn't really a roadmap like that. It's kind of a lot of trial and error and finding out where I fit and how my art fits. You know, learning, you know, what people like about my work, not what I think they like. You know, there's, I mean, I have pieces that I love that, that aren't as popular, but you know, you got to see what people like and understand how you fit in that. It's a, it's a tough question. But I honestly think if you approach, you know, your art like a business, you know, it's still fun, rewarding. But if you want it to be, you know, to be serious about it and take that next step, you need to, you know, treat it as such. Skeletons don't need helmets. Just render in a couple of, uh, textures in there. The follow-up would be, would you ever consider coaching an intern for hire? So the question is, is uh, would I coach an intern? If I had more time, I would love to be able to teach or, or have interns. Um, in the future, maybe, but right now my schedule is so tight with what I, my traveling and everything else that I do that it, I don't think I could, could give an honest um, could help someone enough. I wouldn't want to commit to that because my schedule just doesn't allow for that kind of time at this, 
the disjuncture. And I wouldn't want, you know, to take someone's effort and not be able to deliver on my side. But in the future, maybe, you know, it might be something we look into to try and share a little more. That's why I try and have these open forum videos and try and um, answer as many questions as I can. Because I know when I, when I um, do my artist in residency in Disney and there's so many illustrative sc illustration schools around there, I do a lot of, um, I just talk to so many young people asking the same kind of questions. And, and I try and talk as long as I can, as much as I can to answer some of those, as many of those questions as I can. And I know that they're out there. I know people have them. So we know there's a need for it. So for now, this is really all we can fit in our schedule, but I'm definitely open to, I mean, any questions you guys have here, I can try and help out all I can. What led you to start live painting at your shows? The question was, what led me to start live painting at my shows? And that's a great question. It's actually, in some part, really, I, I owe that live painting to my style. Um, when I first started doing shows, I realized that I used to just sit behind a table and sketch in my sketchbook. And even that, people were just enamored with wanting to see what I was working on. And, you know, I realized quickly that people want to see you make the art that you're selling. They just want to see art being made. I mean, they don't get a chance to see it much besides for maybe a spray painter in Vegas or something terrible like that, you know, or they never get a chance to see real art being made or art that interests them. Maybe they see a plain air painter, but not art that they get. So I realized quickly that people enjoyed that. And I wanted to, you know, let them see how I do this art. And, you know, see that it wasn't digital, you know, kind of see all the, the style come to life. And so I realized I wanted to paint live. So I basically got, got out from behind the table. You know, I got an easel. I started painting out front and started looking for paints that would really be fun to watch quickly. I used to paint in all enamel. And the problem with that is um, it takes forever to dry. And it doesn't look like much like this black line work isn't till the very end. But there's so much line work, um, so much work before that doesn't look great in the enamel. That wasn't a great live demo kind of paints. So I quickly discovered gouache when I was on a search for something that really would show my style better. And that combination of gouache and enamel that works so well for live painting really started to become my signature medium, and really kind of crafted the way I render everything. It really gave me the the kind of the keys to the castle in terms of unlocking what my brain saw and getting that from my brain to my hands. What is lowbrow? Um, lowbrow art or lowbrow the company? Lowbrow art. Oh, this question is what is lowbrow? And, and that's, again, that's, that's a funny conversation. That's the term most commonly used to describe this style of art, pop surrealism, all this art that kind of came out in the, let's root in the 70s, or really the 80s and 90s kind of, um, again, the best way is to kind of look at the custom culture scene and Robert Williams is kind of the founder of that, the lowbrow tag and where it kind of came from. And I encourage you to look up if you don't know Robert Williams and you definitely need to look into that. Um, but that lowbrow kind of describes all the pop surrealist movement, um, kind of the rejection of the, the classical, you know, ideals. It's often very figurative, um, really kind of captures all that outsider art. You know, it captures the maybe some of the graffiti and, you know, a lot of that stuff that would have a formal way, a formal title. It's not, you know, Andy Warhol, you know, contemporary in that way. But I encourage you to definitely look, look um, Robert Williams up. And, and he has a great explanation of some of those ways where he got to the, the lowbrow title. And it really helps kind of explain that, how they got the title and what it really means to them. Move the camera down so I'm just... adjust the camera here a little bit. You know what? I'm gonna go this way. That's a little easier. <clears throat> so just the last thought on the lowbrow thing is, is while it's not, I understand what they mean, what it was, why it was what it was. I don't love the term because I think it's just too big a term. It encompasses so much work. But it's our term, you know. There is no better term for it. There is no better, you know kind of word that explains what we do. So right now I am painting with enamel and the brush that I'm using, which I just had a question for, 
this is a pinstriping brush. Um, just regular uh, golden synthetic hair, dyed black. And it's just a, a, your basic script liner. There's nothing kind of... Oh, so the mediums I'm painting with, just to, sorry, got lost there for a second in my own brain. Um, so the mediums now, the blue, the space background that you see here is all acrylic. And then the colors, everything but the, except for the dark line work, is all done with gouache. And that's like an opaque watercolor. And what I'm doing now is enamel, and that's like a pinstripers paint like you see on the cars. And because the first are water-based and this is oil-based, they go right over each other, no problem at all. And so when the painting's all finished, I'll give it a clear coat, and the clear coat will make all the colors be the same sheen, because right now the, the enamel is obviously very shiny. Also really gives a vibrance to the gouache, which tends to be very matte, because the water-based. And so I'm gonna be doing these little smalls. Um, I think I have three or four over the next couple weeks before Comic-Con. So we're gonna do um, a couple more on Facebook. We may bounce over to Twitter and do it, I mean, uh, to Instagram and do a couple. So keep an eye out, we'll do a bunch more stuff. And as, as always, any questions you have, feel free to fire them over. Uh, this is for Comic-Con San Diego, for those who just joined. So these will be released along with, I'm going to say I'll probably have four or five small originals for Comic-Con San Diego. Uh, somebody said they've been following you for a while and they saw you at Art America's in Fresno. Oh, excellent, yes. Uh, someone's mentioning seeing the work at, at Art America at Fresno. Excellent. They've been so great working with them. Um, just really helpful to artists. And they put on a great show, and the show's grown every year. So um, really becoming a, the, the scene in Fresno for the, uh, the Day of the Dead celebration. It's really great to see how much it's grown. Frank and those guys just really have it together. So shout out to them for just really making it easy for artists to be part of their show. Do any artists inspire you? Do any artists inspire me? Well, of course. Um, you know, I got started watching Bob Ross as a kid. As, as goofy as that sounds, that was when I first saw painting. And I used to watch every day. And my parents, you know, got me a set of paints and used to, you know, make happy little trees and little mountains. And, you know, that's how I learned that painting, you know, just how to paint. That painting was a thing besides just, you know, seeing it in museums. It was something that I thought, oh, you can do this. People do this. Um... So in that way, it got me started, you know, but for actual things that inspired my work later in life, um, I have to say Francis Bacon is one of my favorites. Um, just his scary um, Pope painting series is one of my favorites. Look it up. It's, it's uh, terrifying um, and wonderful. Um, really inspired by, you know, 15, 1600s, um, the religious paintings, the versions of, of hell, you know, seven layers of hell with, thousands of characters painted inside them. I mean, just amazing stuff that, you know, boy, had my, you know, Sunday school teachers ever shown that kind of stuff, I would have been way more interested. Just really, you know, these full paintings of devils and, and monsters. I mean, I, I just find that amazing stuff being painted back then. And for contemporary artists, there's a lot of artists I love to watch their feet. I just find what they do great. Um, Grizz Grimley is one of my favorites to watch. Beautiful watercolor style with a monster twist. Just really good stuff. Um, Nikos Graffiti, I love his colors and his, his compositions are just been one of my favorites for years. Definitely encourage you to check him out. Um, I kind of get inspired by a lot of different, you know, the concept artists, you know, doing these amazing space scenes and mostly digital. Like I, I don't, you know, understand digital. It, it makes my brain hurt, but just seeing some of the beautiful landscapes and some of the concept stuff that's being pumped out. It's just really beautiful. And I really find inspiration in everything from that contemporary work to, you know, plague paintings from the 1500s. I have a, a wide range of things that inspire me. Is 
the brush a dagger striper? So the question is, is this brush a dagger striker, a striper? Um, nope, it's just a regular um, a script liner. There is no width to the brush. It's a synthetic hair. Uh, most daggers are natural. Um, and so the difference between a natural and a synthetic brush is that for me, I find natural brushes to be too dead. They, they involve a pull stroke where, I'll just demonstrate here on the, move my painting for a second. So a pull stroke is more of like a pinstriper which would be this kind of this kind of position and it's more of a, a pull and you're kind of and you're and you're twisting the brush and, and, and working your wrist a whole different science and, and magic um and my strokes tend to be i tend to work the brush a lot more where i'm using the thick and the thin i'm popping more the you know just i i need the brush to do a little more than that and to be a little more lively to me it's kind of how i imagine it make sure i'm already centered here so you can see what i'm doing Let's zoom out a little bit here. Burr, burr, burr. Let's see. Let's see. Right. Is that better? Here we go. I'm mystified by the pinstriping stuff, and the guys are amazing. You know, watching those guys work is just—it's uh, some kind of weird sorcery. It's—I uh, can pull. I'm the best um, asymmetrical pinstriper, and none of myself ever will match. You know, one side will never match the other side. <laughs> But that this enamel paint and doing hot rod shows when I first started is how I discovered my style really because having enamel paint and doing this is just how my brain sees stuff and gives me the power to be able to you know just draw what my head sees. I feel like NASA should issue space bows. Good questions tonight. Speaking of, somebody said, do you play music when you're painting in your studio? And if so, what do you listen to? Someone's asking if I play music when I paint in my studio, and I do. The only reason that you don't hear it as loud is because Facebook um, pulls videos down that have audio in the background on live stuff. So we've got to be careful how loud we let it play. So um, I do play music, and I play, oh, geez, I have a very, very eclectic iPod. Um, I'm a huge fan of... You know, uh, Dropkick Murphys and Floggy Molly and, and um, kind of the Irish punk angle, I would call it, I guess. Um, pirate music is what people call it who <laughs> are disparaging to it in my household. Um, uh, the Rum Jacks, Australia, a couple of the, um, that kind of stuff. I love um, uh, hillbilly music, as my household would also describe my music. Um, big, big fan of acoustic, bluegrass. Um, you know, I love some of my punk stuff, too. It's really a wide, eclectic mix of, uh, of music that plays in here. But always playing. Either that or I'm playing movies that I've seen a billion times that I don't have to look up to watch. Um, like the top five would be Army of Darkness, The Thing, Aliens, um, Alien. Yes, I believe the Alien is better than Aliens. And that's also a hot issue, contested issue in my household. Um... What else often? Uh, 
Big Trouble Little China also plays a lot in my room and Escape from New York. Die Hard Tombstone. Uh, Die Hard Tombstone. That's probably like the top 10 that play here all the time. Do you have a portfolio of commercial design? Do I have a portfolio of commercial design? I do, and I no longer even show or share that. So I, before I was a full-time artist, I was a designer and doing commercial work. And I no longer, boy, I haven't even dug into that in a long time. So, Because my commercial work now tends to be artwork I've done for companies for the last five years. And that's kind of um, where that is. And you know what? There isn't a good central location for that. Um, but it's kind of all over. And the good thing is I have a ton more coming that you're going to see uh, very soon. Uh, so reiterate that you're using one shot. Yeah, so right now I'm using one shot enamel, someone was asking. And then what brand is the brush that are you using? So the brush that I use is, this is a, a Kafka brush. Um, they're okay. I've, I, I use them the most. Um, I take care of them. I, I, I'm, I know I take care of brushes. I just find that they tend to blow out a little earlier than I'd want them to. Um, I just find that they start to split. You start to get snake, uh, snake tongue, fork tongues. You know, where the bristles just get a little too, um, they wear out. But I also use, use them a ton. That's the only reason I don't give them a ringing endorsement is because uh, they do wear out a little fast for my liking. But they are they are fairly good. That's the Kafka brush and Coast Airbrush carries those. And you can find them online. They're in Anaheim. When you're using acrylics, do you water them down to make them more fluid? And what do you keep them from drying out so fast? So for acrylics, the question was, do I use a, do I water down my acrylics? And what do I do to keep them from drying out so fast? Um, I do water them, water them with water, but I do not, I basically, when I'm painting my backgrounds, I paint the background, I use the paint I've mixed, and then it, the, the paint goes into the trash. I don't try and save it. Um, acrylics is just too frustrating a medium to try and keep alive um, for the way I use it. I mean, like you see here, I'm just doing it as backgrounds, and that's it. So um, one way you can keep them alive a little longer is obviously to mix them on top of a palette of wet paper towel. That tends to give them a little bit longer. Um, but you know what? If, if you're trying to keep your acrylics longer, I would suggest looking at um, Golden makes a, a fluid, not fluid, sorry. They make it, a, um, they call it open acrylic. And basically it's designed more like oil to give you a little more luminosity, but it also stays wet for two to four days um, in a normal, like, you know, normal temperature. So I would, I'd tell you to look at that. If, if keeping your colors, you know, from drying out is a big problem because um, they make a few good palette, plastic palettes that you put wet paper towels or wet, you know, sponges in the bottom of, and that gets you a little bit of time. But um, at least with the open acrylics from Golden is you get, you know, you're guaranteed to get three or four days without doing anything to it. So I'd, I'd encourage you to take a look at that. How do you do your back? So the question is, how do I do my background? So basically, it's a layer of layers and layers of acrylic. Even this small guy here is probably, he's a small one, probably four to five layers of acrylic. And I rub it on, I scrub it on, I wipe it on, wipe it off. I would start with the lightest tone and work my way to the darkest tone. And while I know what I'm, you know, I know the ballpark I'm going to end up in, you know, I do not know the finished look and feel. You know, I know that it was going to be, a, you know, cool colors cool as in a temperature cool um but other than that it's, it's kind of a happy little you know journey to i'm like oh i want this move towards that and you just kind of you know keep working in the same direction and and then you know it's a happy little uh destination you're like oh that's what it's gonna look like how long on average does a painting take to complete the question is how long on average does a painting take to complete so something like this let me give a little birthmark here before it happened um this is short. This is a, a warm-up, you know, uh, practice kind of uh, piece for me. Um, I tend to do much larger pieces. These are fun also, though, because I, I can be spontaneous. I can take chances. They're really exciting in that little package. So these guys here are probably all in, you know, three hours, four hours. For this, he's the tiniest one. Um, and then the bigger paintings, you know, in the... 1824 size range, which tends to be the normal, you know, in between range I paint in. You're looking at probably 25, 30 hours. But to give you a little uh, sneak, sneak info, I'll be releasing a painting at Disney 
which will be the long, longest painting that's ever taken me to paint. If you've been following my stream recently, you can probably uh, know which subject matter that is. But that painting there was the longest I've ever taken. At how long? Um, at almost... Was it almost 100 hours that we figured out? Oof. I think it was almost... That painting was almost 100 hours. I think it was in, in the high 80s, low 90s. Very long, forever. Really fun to paint, but boy, it was long. Yes, anybody in the crowd uh, going to Comic-Con in San Diego? We're all just watching, cursing them. We've been on the waiting list for six years. We were really excited to get a call just a week or so ago to let us know that we were going to be in this year. Oh, excellent. And if you are going... We'll probably be doing a, uh, a secret giveaway. If you followed before, you've seen uh, some of the custom Funkos. I think you can probably expect to see some giveaways of those too. How many little guys do you think? Uh, this is how many little guys you're going to have. I assume the Funkos is what you mean. So, how many little Funkos am I going to have? I will have at least one for every day. Oh, she's painting some small children. Paintings, I think, um, let's see, I have one, two, three. I think I'll have at least four, as many as six. You have a small booth. You have a very small booth, yes. The booth is half the size I normally do at shows, so we're going to have to make some room. That's why I but they have a bunch of little smalls like this, so. So someone just popped in and asked if this is one shot. It is. Yep, yeah, one shot over gouache and then over the acrylic background. So all the colors you see here are all gouache and the back, all the blue, the background is, uh, is acrylic. And I cheated and I did those before I came on. As long as we've gone without anybody asking about the dogs, mm -hmm. they're going to be bummed. Does the music motivate you to paint? And the question is, does music does the music motivate me to paint? And uh, definitely. Um, it's funny, I, I won't hear it sometimes, and sometimes I'll overly hear it. If I'm live, live demoing and there's a good band playing near me, because a lot of shit, you know, a lot of festivals have, you know, music and... Uh, I love it. I mean, I paint, just, I pay street performers. Um, like when I'm in, in Tucson, Arizona, they have street performers that, you know, they travel all around the, the the show and there's some really good ones and I'll pay them to come play in front of my booth. You know, I love to hear the music. I love to see everybody else enjoy it. I, I really find music an important part of, of uh, my art creation. So, well, it seems like they're just, you know, asking because I mentioned it, but the dogs are, uh, are doing excellent. The, uh, they've all swollen back to original size. We had a bee incident, for those who might not know, um, last week. The fatty face boxer became even more fatty face. But uh, we did a little ER visit and got her back to uh, normal size. But she was all swelled up. I think it's just a plea for attention. Tell us 
about the custom and themed frames you make? Someone's asking about the custom frame, custom themes I make for my frames. Um, so if you're just tuning in, for all my big originals, I design custom frames to fit the paintings. Um, it's really a fun way for me to finish the story. Like if I'm doing a military frame, you know, I'll take elements of the vehicles, you know, whether it be rivets or, you know, paint schemes or camo or, you know, iron. Um, the adjust this so you can see what I'm doing here. Really trying and, and build the frames to match, you know, the, the piece that's in it. Because I like to, you know, I don't want to just go to a store and buy something gold gilded frame and slap it in there. I want it to be, you know, part of the story. Um, so I really kind of build the frames to match. And it's really become something that as I'm painting the pieces, I'm already thinking about, oh, this, uh, this little pattern would be great for the frame. Or, okay, I'm painting it this thing that way. I can use that, you know, as the base for the frame. Or it's really, for me, a fun... It gets me out off the easel, gets me out in the wood shop um, to build these the custom ideas. It really is fun. It's a fun part for me. It's kind of become one of my trademarks, and I'm glad that it is. I think it's really a creative outlet. And I used to carve tiki's years ago, and I think it kind of fills that tiki carving void. So the question came about the brush again, and somebody said, is it, it's a dagger brush, so you need to clarify that. Uh, I, all right. It's a Kafka brush. It doesn't say dagger anywhere on and, and dagger. It's, just, it's called a script liner. It's what, if you're looking for it, it's going to be called a script liner. He may call it a dagger, but script liner is what I use. Someone's just saying it's called a dagger brush. Uh, it might be, but every brush I use, I have 20 different companies in front of me and they're all, they call these a script liner. So if you're trying to look for something like this, that's most commonly what I use. It's called, a, um, cause to me, the dagger is a fatter hair natural brush. So I'm, Confused at the um, at the dagger word, but that might just be what he what he calls it. I just know that the the, the companies I used before this. Um, if I'm trying to get something like my brush, then a synthetic script liner is going to lead you in the right direction. I'm missing my brush box, or I would show some more. They're all in the uh, that box. Yeah. No, it's not a dagger. I'm looking at them. Yeah, it's not a dagger. It's a script liner. Sorry. If I was not clear, but it was script. It is a script liner. He has daggers too, but this is a. Here, I'll clean it off so you can see the. Script liner. Oop, hold this way. It's hard with the camera angle. So you can see a Kafka script liner. <clears throat> I was looking for a dagger, but I have none here. <clears throat> but I am a, hey, I'm a brush nerd. I've tried everything. Daggers, paddles, flats, rounds. I, I, I find uses for all of them, but everyday use, you know, the strip liner for me is the most versatile. It just fits kind of how my brain draws things out. And reiterate your coating on coated masonite. Yeah, someone's asking what I'm painting on, so I'll just show you guys again. This is a coated masonite. It's from a company called Ampersand, and it's it's a it's a hardboard. I like painting on hardboard. I'll give you my, my little hardboard speech. Um, I just find it when I was showing you guys earlier about the strokes that I use. Let me just slide this aside here and show you. You know these kind of quick strokes. The reason I like synthetic fi um, fiber brushes. You know these kind of. You know just these these shapes that my head sees things in. Um, are made possible by three things. One, the enamel, because I can go, I can make little short lines and, and be done and not have to go back in and do anything, you know, boom, 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 that they're there. The enamel is, 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 the, is the key. The brush, being a nice script liner and a synthetic fiber, allows me to push off, splat the brush kind of. All these little shapes that you can't do as much with a synthetic, with a natural hair. Natural hair is kind of very lazy to me. It's just a, a fat brush and it's more of a pull stroke and you and you adjust pressure that way. And the third factor is the hard surface. I paint on canvas, you know, for years. That's just what we're told. Everything art is painted on. And 
I hate it for two reasons. One, I hate trying to fill in when I make a little line. You get all the little dots inside there that don't fill in the paint because of the texture of the canvas. Um, even the finest textured canvas still has some texture to it. It's not like it's a hot pressed paper feel. So um, I just like the firmness of the substrate where I can really just push, pull. There's no give. I'm the only thing applying pressure to it. So I get to decide, you know, all of it. When you got a canvas, there's some give, there's some pushback, pull. Um, I just don't enjoy that as much. My strokes are very um, precise and thin and, and I lean hard on my hand. It's just kind of easier for me to use the, the more solid substrate, if that makes any sense. And you're a lefty. <laughs> and I'm a lefty. I've overcome many challenges. Good questions. So we're gonna try and, yeah, over the next couple of weeks, I mentioned again, we're gonna do more of these. We're gonna keep them short and sweet so you can kind of get in, get out. I wanna keep you guys hogged up here, listen to my, my boringness the whole time, but we're gonna do a couple more of these, probably at least two more before Comic-Con. And I, hmm? Mid-July. Yeah, mid-July is Comic-Con. So in the next two weeks, Two and a half weeks. Um, we'll do a couple more of these. What do you have after uh, Comic Con coming up? Question was, what do I have coming up besides Comic Con or after Comic Con? Um, I'll be at the Gilroy Garlic Festival. One of the uh, most fun and smelliest of all the events. Um, great time out there. They have all kinds of crazy garlic-infused foods. I mean, if you're from that area, you know they have garlic ice cream. Yeah, it's, it's as weird as it sounds. Um, so we have that event, which is always really fun. That's three days of painting outside with everybody. And then after that, um, for the month of August, I'll be prepping for my artisan residency in uh, at Disney in September. Um, I'll have a... And since you're on the stream, I can tell you guys... I'll have three new pieces I'll be releasing um, at Disney. Um, there'll be two Star Wars pieces, which I work with Lucas Films on, so we're really excited to release those. And I have one Disney-specific piece for the Jungle Cruise, which I'll be releasing also. Um, that'll all be formally released on, the, I believe, September 2nd. That Saturday, we'll be doing an official release and signing. Um, unfortunately, it's only going to be available at the Wonderground Gallery here. And I, I'm not sure about the one in Orlando, though we'll know soon. Um, but we're really excited about that. I've been working on those. I finished those months ago. And I'm just really excited to show everybody because it's all been top secret. So I'm excited to... And if anybody, any lawyers are listening, I have not said anything. I am just kidding. But we're excited to release all that stuff in September. So August is really just going to be a get work done um, and get ready because I have a bunch of other surprises for my Disney, my Disney artist and resident. So we're really excited. Are you going to be at New York Comic Con? Question is, am I going to be at New York Comic Con? I'm not going to be there. Um, that's a little far. We're trying to figure out logistically if that's a possibility in the, in the coming years. Um, right now, we have a conflict also on that show date, so we're just trying to figure out if that will ever be a possibility. From the East Coast, so I would love to one day make it out there. And when is the San Diego Comic Con? Question. question. Question is, when is the San Diego Comic-Con? And that is the 19th through the 23rd. So Wednesday night is the preview night, and then it's uh, full bore Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday. So I'll be doing, um, I'll have obviously these, these limited edition releases there, and also be doing some uh, Funko custom pops. Um, I'll have at least one for every day, and maybe one random one for a, a trivia question of some sort to help the people who are late, who can't get there every morning. So the question is, do I paint daily, and how many pieces a week do I paint? Um, I, w I do art daily. Um, like the last three or four days, I've been sculpting for some custom sculptures I have um, coming out in a few months. Um, I work on file prep. I work on drawings for future paintings. I will be actually be painting. It's a little bit of everything. Every day is kind of a different, um, something always art business related, whether it be you know, each answering emails or, or getting files together for you know um, licensing. It's always art related. It's not always painting though. It's, it's, it's so many things and 
goes back to the question we had about the the art business. I didn't realize that either. Getting started, that there was so much else you have to do to keep you know answer emails, answer questions, do quotes. Excuse me, all these different things. So my day is really um, everything. I'll be out in the wood shop building frames like we talked about earlier. I'll be um, painting background for future paintings. It's really a wide variety. And I'd say that right now I probably finish about, you know, oh, a painting every two weeks is kind of a, a good ballpark. It's busier during some parts of the year than others. Because I, I do all, most of my painting is all live painting. Um, all the painting I do in the studio is all my commercial work um, for art licensing like um, El Himenor Tequila. I'm doing all their Day of the Dead campaign this year. You'll see it in BevMo's and liquor stores all over the country, as well as a bottle wrap for all the bottles in the UK. Um, that work's all finished and it's been done for months. Um, again, that kind of had to be done off the radar because um, until it's released by them, we don't get to show it. And So the, my days painting in the studio are really reserved for that kind of work. That was a long-winded explanation, I know. I just, I'm long-winded. Uh do you have phone covers for the Samsung Galaxy 7 Edge yet, not for the Edge? Question is, do we have phone covers for the Galaxy 7 Edge? Mm -hmm. And uh, we do not have those yet. We're still waiting for a template from our supplier. But as soon as we get them, we'll bang those out along with the 8s and everything else. Because we know that uh, Apple's is coming soon too. And it just takes them a couple months to get, get a phone in their hand and design the template for us. So we'll try and get those as soon as we can. It's always them holding us up. So you can see now, now I'm just doing some little bit of touch-ups and some little spots that I've missed, but we're uh, home stretch right here. Like I said, we're going to keep these quick and fun and short. And any questions you have, you know, ask them and we'll keep doing, uh, we'll try and do more of these. Yes, so for those watching on uh, who follow on Instagram also, we'll do that video probably in the next couple of days. I think we're thinking maybe tomorrow. Maybe tomorrow, maybe tomorrow night. I know you, all you, you young kids will be doing whatever young people do. But... Do you want to show um, a picture of that piece that you might paint? Well, let's, yeah, let's show. You know what? That's, let me take a second here. So I'm going to sign this guy here on the button, and then I'll show you the other pieces that we're going to do. Will you have gatos prints at Comic-Con? Question is, will I have gatos prints at Comic-Con? And yes, I will. If anyone's looking for something specific at any event, Comic-Con or other, that you're planning on going to see me at, Always message me a few a few weeks in advance and give me a chance to try and, uh, and get something for you if you're looking for uh, for something. Did you work on your signature or did the style develop on its own? So the question is, did I work on my signature or did my style develop on its own? You know, when I started, I didn't want to sign my stuff because I hated how big a signature was and I was really against it. I was, it was a weird, I don't know, weird artist. I don't know why. Um, but people obviously wanted me to sign it, so I started doing it and... The d low has just kind of always been... I want it to be small and subtle on the piece. I don't, let me show you the signature now if you can see it. Can you see it on there? Oh, the whole piece. Oh, I'm show the whole piece. Here's the whole finished piece here. Um, show you the whole piece. So I want it to be small, the signature to be small and out of the way. And that's kind of where the d low kind of came from. It was kind of the way I, I, I sketched it. and just kind of was a nice way to kind of not be overwhelming, but still obviously sign the piece. So you can kind of give you a full little scroll by of the finished piece here. So I'll show that again before we leave, but let me show you the other pieces we're going to do. I'm going to put that right here so you can kind of see that in the frame. There you go. All right, you see that? Let me show you the other pieces we're going to do. We have this little guy here. You can see him. So he's already, same way, I've already done the gouache on him, and he's ready for the enamel. So you can kind of see him. And he has a little... Same thing. So these are all little vintage frames I found. I've been collecting frames for years. 
So I have just piles of really cool things I find interesting. And here's this little frame. Let me, let me zoom back out a little bit. There you go. So you're gonna see that frame there. So that's one of the other pieces we'll do um, in the next week or two before Comic-Con. And then I have another one ready to go over here. So this is more of the, a cute, fun style. Here's of a slightly more serious style that we're gonna paint. And this piece is actually going in a, let me show you guys here, a hands full and crowded desk. And so he's gonna be going in a much more, I'm actually gonna, don't get nauseous, but I'm gonna show, I'm gonna pull back a little bit. So he actually goes in this floral frame here. So you can kind of see how he's gonna be in there. So that just kind of gives you an idea of the other stuff that we have coming up. Cool, interesting stuff. And since you guys all sat here and sat through this, I'll give you another sneak peek. We'll be super sneak peeky. I can't tell anybody if you saw this. But here's another secret release that we have coming out soon, a couple months from now. Pretty cool, huh? Turn this way to get that color. So that's a sculpture that I finished. Um, there'll be a variety of, of finishes. This is actually one of the um, artist proofs with the rash finish. So there you go. That's your sneaky, sneaky, don't tell anybody you saw it. How do you cut your boards for your paintings? So the question is, how do I cut the boards for my painting? So just to show, just to show this guy here. So he's small and he fits this little. So I cut the, I basically have a frame on the small guys here and I pop out this, the glass and take the glass and I use the glass as a template. And then I cut my canvas on a bandsaw, um, cut the wood because it's just masonite. And I cut the wood basically on a, with a bandsaw or with a jigsaw. Um, to fit the uh, the shape of the frame. So here it is in the finished frame and I'll give you a little uh, Kind of finished look at that guy in the frame So the next step this will take about um, probably Honestly 24 hours to dry and to cure so that I can then clear coat over it. So basically um We'll let them dry, and then I'll basically just kind of go through, make sure there's nothing else I want to fix or adjust, and then I give it a clear coat. And the clear coat will really make these blues nice and rich and really make the colors pop. So once that's finished, basically we'll have it ready to go and clear coat it and be on the wall for uh, for the Comic-Con release along with the other paintings. How do you know when to stop and not overdo the painting? Oh, the classic question. When do you? How do you know when to stop and not keep painting? Well, <laughs> some paintings are finished and some are just done. But unlike most people, um, I'm very lucky that my style being so line work driven and, and it's wet that once I get to the bottom, I'm done. You know, I, I'll look through and I'll, if I do a big painting, it's probably an hour of, like right now, I'm, you're still watching and even though I've signed it, I think I'm done. I notice there's a little break line right here. I'll just fix that little guy right there, you know, and put cross lines in there. You know, I can really see if anything's wrong. Like I just have, you know, my eyes will instantly jump to something that I don't like. Um, but at some point, the painting just has to be finished. You have to move on and learn and, and experiment and try something else in a new painting. Um, again, I'm very fortunate that the line work goes from right to left because I'm left-handed and I would smear it if otherwise. So when I get to the end, that painting's finished. I try and make sure that as I'm painting, I'm doing all the detail at a finish level. I'm kind of making sure I look at everything and see everything and like it. Doesn't mean I won't change anything at the end, but on the whole, I finish my paintings. When I get to the end, I'm 95% done. And then I go back and I'll, you know, I may push something back or add a line or a stroke or a little micro line somewhere just to call something out or push something backwards. But when I'm at the end, I'm at the end. Um, how do you prepare your boards for painting? <clears throat> So um, this masonite here, the question is, do I have to do anything to the masonite before I paint on it? Um, I don't, because what I use is a coated masonite from a company called Ampersand, and it already comes pre-gessoed. 
Um, it, it's ready to go. And hold on one second, I'll show you a piece. Unfinished here. Here's an example of uh, how ampersand comes. Let me move my original guy over here. I'll put him over here. So, just like that. And it's just a, a mason. It's, it's a great substrate. It's a coated masonite board. You can see that it's mason in the back. And that's this is their aqua board version. I use their aqua board and their regular regular um, clay board. It's just a really nice substrate. This one has a slight tiny texture to it. Their clay board is completely smooth. I've used both of them. I like both of them. I just go for aqua board because it has just a hair bit of that texture. Um, which I like, and the finished piece just makes it a little more homogenous to the strokes of the of the of the paint. But um, and I, again, I just cut this to fit. Um, for the small stuff, for the big stuff, I build frames around it. Um, but yeah, it's really it's a great surface. It holds color great. It's so excellent for water base. If you're a watercolorist, I would completely recommend this. Um, it's just a really great substrate for water based paints. The gouache, acrylics, it's great for all that. And for the enamel, it, it's just perfect. It really uh, for me has been my my piece of choice. I really uh, despise canvas and really love this. What kind of clear coat do you use? So the question is what kind of clear coat do I use? Um, I use a brush on um, polyurethane. You can't use a spray polyurethane with, an, um, with enamel because the catalyst will make it wrinkle. You can do dust coats and, and, and probably get it to work and there's some good airbrush coating guys who can get it to work but on the whole um, spray clears just are can go too wrong. There's no reason to risk your painting wrinkling up. So I use a brush on polyurethane. I can do it as long as I wait about 24 to 48 hours. Um, I have no problems. It's light fast, it's stable. I have pieces that are 10 years old now and have no kind of discoloring or any kind of thing. So I really, uh, it's really been great. It kind of locks everything in. Have you ever painted your dogs or added them into paintings? <laughs> <laughs> the question is, have I painted my dogs or have I added them into paintings? Uh, yes and yes. Um, so the biggest, uh, I did a full piece of, of Poppy, um, one of my older boxers. Um, I don't have anything online to share that now, but I'll try and dig up a piece. Um, but in the most recent uh, Dia de Esperos piece that has all the dogs in it, both of my dogs are in there. Um, the Vishula is right, the little brown guy is right in front, and the boxer is in there too, looking crazy and uh, wacky. So... I wasn't gonna do a Peros piece and not put my own dogs in there. It's kind of like, you know, the artist's license. When I was painting that piece at Disney, I was getting um, messages from everyone. I did not realize there was this many species of dogs because anyone with a dog of any kind told me to put them in there. So I would have needed 4,000 dogs in that piece to make everybody happy. <clears throat> right, let me give you one last look at this guy here. So again, we're gonna be doing more of these. Um, in the next couple weeks before Comic Con, you'll see all kinds of stuff, and we'll probably have uh, you know we'll share a bunch of other things too. This kind of I like this sharing these ways because I figure if you're willing to sit there and listen to me, that you deserve some extra, whatever extra I can do. So, I'll give you a finished look at this guy here. Do do do. Pull back a little bit so you can see it. So that's the finished piece. And then just in case you guys came late, I'll show you what the. This is him in the frame. So that's how he'll be hanging on the wall. Do you ever paint on canvas anymore? Question is, do I ever paint on canvas anymore? I do not. I just don't find a reason for the frustration for me. Just It, it just doesn't match. I mean, the, the wood is so good that um, I don't think that... I just don't need to. It, uh, it's just too frustrating for me. I have a big fat hand and I lean on the painting and it's just, it's easier to have something that can withstand that kind of push. <clears throat> so get your last couple questions in here and we'll, uh, and we'll wrap it up. See, yeah, already touching stuff up. But again, I want to thank all you guys for, for tuning in and all the support we get. It's really just, it's amazing. This is be, uh, I never knew this is what I'd be doing. And I'm very fortunate and I really appreciate all the support we've got on the road. And really excited for the surprises we have to come out to be able to share with everybody from the surprise Disney pieces to the surprise brewery we can't talk about to everything else. It's, it's a lot of fun what's coming out. <clears throat> 
So just give me one, one quick last look for all those who just tuned in. Here's the finished piece. So someone's asking what I use to dilute the enamel, and that's a great question. Um, so there's a variety of things you can use, you know, paint thinners and such. Um, I use a paint thinner that's basically designed for um, one shot. It's, um, oh, now you've caught me without the name. Hold on one second. Again, the question was what reducer do I use? And that's right here. I use Darby's reducer. You can get that at Pacific Paint Supply. They're up in Seattle. Um, I love it. I've used One Shot's um, reducer, and they make that too, and that works okay. But you got to use either a warm or a cold based on temperature. Kind of, you know, they have, a, they have a one that's kind of all-purpose, and then one that's cold, and one that's for high temperatures. Um, I just like this because it's so stable at every temperature. I've used it and had no problems with it. So I, that, I would definitely say that that's kind of what I enjoy. Um, it's been the most successful for me. Um, it's made by an old sign painter, so I kind of lean on them. It's, it's really something that um, has been great. To, I enjoy. And do you do any more personal pieces if requested? Question is, do I make um, personalized pieces? I do. I do custom commission work. Unfortunately, right now, my commission queue is closed till next year. Um, we have so many projects in the hopper that um, we can't take on anything new. So I have, uh, but we do custom commissions, you know, from everything from military to families to, you know, Day of the Dead style portraiture, all that kind of stuff. But um, we hopefully will be opening back up again, you know, in the February, March-ish kind of range. So right now it's kind of, we're, uh, we're all full up, but we hope to be able to do that again soon. Um, right now, the only way to get a custom from me a piece is um, I have a book on my site, um, an art book, and you can get a customized sketch in the front cover of that. Um, unfortunately, right now that's the, only, that's the only way we have time for a custom piece. That, you know, that's the only way to get a customized um, piece right now. But hopefully in March or so, maybe we'll be able to open that back up if we get caught up. What's your booth number at Comic Con? Five 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 six. Uh, and just so you guys all know, my booth number for Comic Con is five 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 six. It's in the illustrator section, I believe, <laughs> yeah. is what they call it. So, really excited. First Comic-Con. So, um, if you can get past everything else, make sure you swing by and say hello. Again, we're probably we're going to do a giveaways, uh, the Funkos, each day. Um, keep an eye out here, and we'll explain those. And you'll also be able to see some of the more, uh, more paintings, the smalls that I'll have there. So, here's a last look at this finished guy, and then we're going uh, to say goodnight. So... <clears throat> So here's a little, little look at this, and then we'll say goodbye with the shipping department because that always seems to be the highlight. So there's the finished piece. You gotta see from back here. So there you go. And so we'll do some more of these. Again, thanks everyone who joined and asked questions. I mean, feel free as we do these to, to ask more. We really, it's really a fun part for me. I really enjoy it. And we'll uh, we'll walk over and say goodbye to the to. The, the hard-working shipping department. There they are. So tough. Tough day. I mean, she's tired, but maybe maybe he's... He's like, what? Now, see, now it's a thing. Now it's a thing. <laughs> all right, all right. Now, now he's into it. Now he's into it. All right. But thank you, everybody. Uh, I appreciate it. And we'll see you guys again. Okay, okay. We're going to see you guys again soon. All right. It's happening. <laughs> Goodbye.